Let's be honest, the days of only dating one person at a time feel a little old school. In the recent Dating Diaries report, eHarmony found that 45% of Gen Z singles are comfortable dating more than one person at the same time. But while dating multiple people at the same time is fine when you're honest about it, it can be exhausting constantly searching for that special connection. eHarmony can help you find someone who gets you. Their well-rounded personality quiz and expansive profiles help to show the real you and can lead to that genuine connection you've been searching for. So join the dating app that helps you find someone who gets you and see for yourself. eHarmony. Get who gets you. Start free today. Pursuing your future doesn't end at 40. In fact, it may mark the beginning of knowing who you are, what you're capable of, and what you really want. But knowing what's next and how to get there can be a challenge, especially when old narratives play on repeat. Liberty Road is here to share stories so that you can consider your possibilities, pursue your purpose, and move into your future with intention. I'm your host, Netta Jones, and we're here to listen, learn, and liberate dreams one episode at a time. Well, hello, Liberty listeners. Welcome to another episode of Liberty Road. Today, you guys get to hear from Monica Molinar, who is the co-founder of Alloy. And when I tell you that this is a conversation you're going to want to have on repeat, at the end, you'll know that I was telling the truth. Monica has a lot to share with us, not only sharing her co-founder story and kind of how she came into this work and really this mission and vision, but also she's going to have lots of tips for us to better understand kind of what we're going through in perimenopause and menopause. So this is a conversation I'm excited to get into. Monica, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Absolutely. And all the way from? Rotterdam, the Netherlands. So you can hear I'm a New Yorker. I'm not from here, but I, my husband is Dutch. And after almost 25 years of talking about where are we going to live? New York or the Netherlands. I finally was like, I am not having this conversation anymore. We're moving. Let's just go. (laughs) Yeah, we packed up two teenagers and bought a house and renovated it, moved. And started a company. And started a business during the pandemic. It all coincided. Yeah. Okay, you win. You win. (laughs) So tell us a little bit about that company you started. So I started a company called Alloy Women's Health. The intent of it is to connect women who are in perimenopause or menopause with the information that they need about this time of life, the doctors who, you know, are literate in this phase of life and the treatments and solutions that are out there and safe and effective, and then also the solutions themselves. We call it an integrated telehealth and pharmacy platform for women where you can not only get the information, but you can access the doctor and the solutions and have them shipped to your door. We want to close the loop because from my own personal experience, and then also just really understanding once we started the business, what's going on with women in this phase of life. This happened to me and none of us, I think, are alone in in sort of arriving at this phase, like totally unprepared and really ill-informed, and then go to doctors who are equally ill-informed or just don't want to have the conversation. So you expect that your OBGYN will be, you know, really the expert in this phase of life, but you kind of forget that your OBGYNs go into OB to deliver babies and not to talk to menopausal women about, you know, their hot flashes and their new anxieties. (laughs) Yeah. I remember hearing a doctor say exactly that, like OBs cover your entire life, unlike any other doctor, like from birth all the way to geriatric issues. And so they're not specialized in some of these nuanced things, menopause being one of them and perimenopause being one of them. So this seems like really in 2023, we're still having these issues. Like, were you surprised to find that out or did you have a personal experience? Oh my God, I was shocked. My personal experience was that I'm 49 now. I just turned 49. And when I was 39, so 10 years ago, I was tested for the BRCA gene, the BRCA Mm -hmm. breast cancer Mm -hmm. gene, and discovered that I was BRCA1 positive, which didn't come as a huge surprise. My mom and my grandmother, her mother, both had breast cancer twice. And, you know, I've always been screened since the time I was 25 because the 
sort of guidelines are if you have a mother who's had breast cancer 10 years before her first incidence of breast cancer, et cetera. So I've been screened from the time that I was really young, but the only thing that I could do beyond the screening that I was doing was something surgical until I had had kids and was sort of in a different frame of mm -hmm. mind. I wasn't ready to either have a prophylactic overectomy, which is what I ultimately chose to do, or a prophylactic mastectomy, which I have not done yet. And I say yet, because it's actually something that I'm thinking about and probably going to do in the next year, maybe my 50th birthday present to myself. Um, that's quite a 50th birthday present. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I actually have some dear friends too, who've had to go through that. So yeah. I know how intense that is and can be, but I also know the relief that can come with it. That's just the stress. Yeah. It's interesting. Like the breast cancer isn't something that I have generally been afraid of because my mom didn't die from it. My grandmother didn't die from it. They both were, you know, treated and my mother is still alive. And yeah. 40 years later, I always kind of, I don't know, convinced myself that this wasn't something that I really needed to worry about. And that having my ovaries out was sort of really good risk prevention for somebody in my case, which I think the research shows that it is. And But if you are BRCA positive, you have something like an 80% lifetime risk of getting breast cancer. And it's sort of independent of anything. Yeah. We don't have the information yet to know, you know, and this is one of the things that I was really trying to, to figure out 10 years ago was like, what if I eat more broccoli? What if I do more weight training? What can I do to sort of change my my own personal risk factors? And that's when I started to get shocked by the medical <laughs> sort of establishment yeah. when there was literally no response. It was like, we don't know. This is actually a pretty new gene, I think, you know, even in the last 15, 20 years maybe or or less, like it went from being only knowing about BRCA1 to now there's BRCA1 and BRCA2. And so I think it's also something that we need to kind of understand as people that like science is not always complete or is never complete. And there's yeah. always stuff that we don't know. And But the sad thing is that there's so much that we don't know about women and women's health and women's bodies. And just menopause has been treated for certainly the last 20 years, I mean, prior to the Women's Health Initiative study in 2002, which is kind of what started all of this like lack of estrogen replacement therapy for women in menopause and lack of treatments for menopause, 40, more than 40% of American women were taking hormone replacement therapy before 2002. It was like the most prescribed treatment in the United States for men or for women. Mm -hmm. And then when the headlines came out that estrogen will give you breast cancer, will cause breast cancer, which we know now to be untrue. And even at the time in that study was not true. Prescriptions dropped overnight. And as a result, unfortunately, yeah. you know, the women have lost collectively three years off their lives. The rate of breast cancer has gone steadily up. The rate of osteoporosis, heart disease, and Alzheimer's has gone steadily up for women. And I'm jumping around a lot, but with the breast cancer specifically, as and my own personal decisions, what I've really learned from talking to women over the last three or four years, and you know, really intensely, in particular, a lot of women who are navigating menopause now post a breast cancer diagnosis, it's really difficult. And you know, if I can avoid that, obviously, I will do my best to do so. But I think sure. there are just there are so many things that we don't know. But there's a lot that we do know and we've that we've kind of forgotten. And I think that that's what we're really trying to reconnect women with is the science that it's out there. We've had data for more than 80 years, I think now. Women started taking estrogen in the 40s in the United States. And it was known, it wasn't even sort of challenged that if you take estrogen from the time that you're in menopause, in the menopausal transition, that women who took estrogen were known to have a lower incidence of heart disease, for example. Yeah. So we kind of forgot all of that when this breast cancer scare just turned women and doctors off overnight. Doctors stopped learning about it in medical school. We've been told by some medical professors, actually, at medical schools that, you know, at the time, really the prevailing thought was like, why should we even teach this when women won't take it? So right. we don't even need to learn about it. There are so many reasons why women's health at this stage of life has been deprioritized. It's considered like a normal phase of life. and But what we know from speaking 
I mean, I know from my own personal experience, but also from what we hear from women all the time is that there's a lot of suffering out there and, you know, just lack of clarity about why you're having certain symptoms. I mean, for example, like palpitations, you know, the number of women who go to see cardiologists and get unnecessary tests for palpitations when really if you're a 49 year old or 51 year old woman who presents to a doctor with like, I'm, I'm feeling more anxious. I can't really sleep at night. I'm sweaty. I'm, you know, my vagina is dry and sex is more painful. And, and I'm having these palpitations. Like, you know, the first thing should be you're in, probably in perimenopause or menopause. Like <laughs> let's fix that first. Let's see if that helps. And then if that doesn't help, if estrogen therapy, hormone therapy doesn't help you. And it's really a, will help most women and is really indicated for most women more than what we think, you know, then if that doesn't work, then you can sort of go from there. But it should be the first line treatment for women in this phase of life, because biologically, we know exactly what's happening. We know that all of these symptoms are brought on by the decrease in estrogen and ultimately the loss of total loss of estrogen in your body or near total. Thank you for giving us kind of that history. And I want to come back to that because I think it's for many reasons, important for us to unpack why the conversation is where it is now and why it was sort of dormant for so long. But first, I want to go back to sort of your startup story. You had your own experience, and was it really born of that, that you decided, hey, I want to play in this field. I want to understand and help other people understand more about what is and isn't available to us and really re-educating people. Yeah. How did all that kind of come together and become what is now Alloy? It's a long story, but basically my first son was born when I was 30, about to be 31. And I went back to work. He's now 18 and a half. So, you know, it's a long time ago. Life was different. There was no Zoom. There were way fewer options for women to, or people to work remotely or from home. And I am had a caregiver issue when my son was about nine months old. I lost faith in the woman who was taking care of him. I was doing a lot of traveling for work at the time. So I really needed somebody who was available and taking care of my infant and who could stay over, you know, sort of late and stuff until I would get home. And we had to let her go. It was, I think, December 23rd, 2005. I was about to go to the Netherlands to go see my family-in-law for Christmas and Then I would come back on the beginning of January and go back to work, but I had nobody to take care of my baby. And I called the HR department at the company where I was working and I said, you know, I have this issue. I don't have anyone to take care of my baby. I'm going away for the holidays and and I'll be back on January 3rd or something. And can I work from home or part time until I find somebody to take care of him? And they said no. (laughs) So I was like, okay, well... They said, we have a policy against flexibility, and it was a a furniture manufacturing company, and they said, if we let people in management work from home or part-time or or flexibly, then we have to let everybody who's on the manufacturing floor have the same rights, and we don't want to do that. So they said, you can take your two weeks of vacation for the year and find a new caregiver, or you can leave. That was sort of my choice. It wasn't much of a choice. You know, obviously, like as a 31-year-old new mother with an infant and family across the world, I couldn't take my only two weeks of the year for vacation the first two weeks of the year and then not have a day off for the rest of the year. It just wasn't workable. So it really set in motion sort of a, well, the next 10 years for me, but really like this sort of identity shift of the woman who is always going to work to being a stay-at-home mom. And then in those 10 years, my husband was actually at Lehman Brothers. So a few years later, in 08, after I had had my second baby, it was either go back to work full-time or be fully sedated. So I (laughs) went back to work full-time. And then in a couple of years after that, that job wasn't really, you know, my favorite job. And so then I worked part-time and Actually, it was opposite. I worked part-time in PR for a while, and then I got a full-time job in 08, and then I left again. And I was sort of always in and out, depending on kind of what the family needs were. And and I had really been kind of scarred by this caregiver situation. So I really, obviously, my first priority in those years when my kids were so young was to take care of them. My husband was traveling all the time, and so we just needed somebody at home making sure that things were were solid. So that was me. I was the mom. I was earning less. 
it was like I was just sort of being forced into this position in quotes, but obviously, you know, I also was okay with it and, and happy to be with my kids. And then I was 39 and I had this surgery and it was clear I wasn't going to have any more kids naturally. And my kids were getting older. My younger one was in kindergarten already. And, and my husband kind of looked at me after the surgery and was like, okay, what are you going to do now? <laughs> Cause you know, the kids don't need you anymore and you're 40 years old. And I don't think you want to get to 50 without having worked, you know, like right. then what are you going to do when you're 50 and you haven't worked in the last 20 years? Like it's, that's not really the time to start. And I was enraged, of course, like, <laughs> how dare you say that to me? Yes. And then, you know, and then I was like, oh, he's probably right. And also like, just, you know, financially, it was important. And for the structure of our marriage and our relationship, it was important. And I realized, like, I got to get my ass back to work, basically. How on earth am I going to do that? I haven't really worked in 10 years. And I wanted to do something different. And I wanted to work in food. And I realized, you know, sort of at that point, like, I haven't been working in really dedicated to working in so long. The jobs that I had had always felt um, less important than my job at home. Mm -hmm. I knew what I was missing. I had worked full time. I had worked part time. I had not worked at all and been a stay at home mom. Like, you know, I had really done a lot of things. And I knew that for me to really sink my teeth into something and was important. I, I needed to really believe in what I was doing. I needed to be really interested and feel like I had some ownership over this process in order to for it to be worth it for me to kind of leave what I was doing, which was managing my family, essentially. And now I'm 40, and I want to do something different that I haven't done before. And I literally couldn't get a job. Like nobody wanted to hire me to do anything even $10 an hour internships, which, you know, were in food, like, wow, I, I reached out to lots of people. And it didn't matter that I, I have a good education. I went to Brown University, I went to Stanford Business School, then I was just like a 40 year old woman who hadn't really progressed in her career in 10 years. And I was like, if I want to do something and ever get employed by somebody, I need to create the experience for myself. So I started thinking about entrepreneurship and starting a business. And like, that's the only way that I will actually be able to sort of work and operate at the level that I, that I want to, and I know that I can, but where I can learn on the job and not be expected to know things that I haven't done before and, you know, have experience that I didn't have. So I started kind of talking to people and really everybody. I'm actually naturally a pretty shy and introverted person, which is funny because I don't operate like that, but I up until that point in my life, I had never felt capable or confident to do your own thing, to yeah. start a business, to do my own thing, yeah. to talk to people about, you know, stuff that I didn't really know that much about and sort of expose that I wasn't an expert in X, Y, or Z was uncomfortable for me. But I knew at that point that I didn't really have a choice and that I had, this was something that I needed to do both for all the reasons, for myself, for my you know, for my marriage, for my parenting, for all the things I needed to do this. And so I literally started talking to everybody who I met, <laughs> like, hi, I want to work in food. And this is what I want to do. And here are some of the thoughts. And I really got practiced at talking about what I was doing, what I was interested in. And, and ultimately, I was talking to a woman, like literally on the sidelines of the soccer class that my, you know, kindergartner was was in. And we would be there week after week. And I started telling her what I was doing or what I was interested in. And she was like, oh, you should meet my friend. She wants to start a tahini business. And so we met and ultimately I partnered with her and another woman to open a shop in Chelsea Market in New York City called Seed and Mill, which is still a really great little business selling tahini and halva, which is a set confection made yeah. from sesame and really delicious. So it was the perfect training ground um, for me in entrepreneurship. I had, you know, I had to navigate partnership and what that looked like and the ups and downs of that. I, you know, just raising some money and literally building out a shop and getting people to help us. And we, we had $400,000 that we started the business with. And now seven years later, it's still running. And it was a great experience and set me up for what I'm doing now. But after a few years of doing that, that partnership didn't really gel in a way. It was good in the beginning, and then we we were sort of stepping on each other's toes too much. We had overlapping skills, and somebody needed to take that business forward, and, and I didn't want that person to be me at that point. 
whoever was going to take it forward had to kind of buy con- the controlling interest. And I didn't have any money to put into it. It wasn't the right fit. Right. So I said, I'm moving on. Let me ask you really quickly. In all of that process, did you start to really identify the things about entrepreneurship that you loved and the things that you didn't? Yeah. Did you kind of find your space after all of that time of not working in like, this is what Monica does really well. This is what Monica wants to do. A hundred percent. And did you want to return to food? No, I just, what I do really well, I think is... One, I'm kind of a dreamer and I get indignant about things. So (laughs) I identify things that I'm interested in or big ideas and um, get people to coalesce around that idea. So although I said I can be shy and introverted, I have a lot of friends and I have a huge network and I love people and I'm really curious and I ask questions. I actually talk a lot. So I'm saying contradictory things, but I love being an entrepreneur It gives me the opportunity to really be creative. It gives me the opportunity to talk to lots of people and to, you know, sort of get people to to be interested or to become knowledgeable about something that they might not have known. And to catch the vision for what you're doing. Yeah, it's great. And I've been really lucky for some reason. I don't I seem to be able to kind of identify trends as the wave so far, at least two out of two, like as a wave is coming up. So it it just so happened that I met my partner, Ann Fullenweider, who at the time was uh, the editor-in-chief of Mary Clara magazine. And we were both on vacation with our families. And we both had small puppies that were only, you know, like eight weeks old. And so we were, of course, the only two people who were out on the streets in this little town walking the dogs at 630 every single morning for, you know, a few (laughs) weeks. And so um, we started chatting and, you know, kind of women are want to do. And what's fun is we just went really deep, really fast and started talking about, you know, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? We were both around in our mid forties and, you know, trying to sort of figure out she had been working in magazines for 20 or 25 years and the magazine industry wasn't really going, you know, like a rocket ship. (laughs) No, it wasn't. So she was at a point in her career where she was sort of could envision making a switch And I reached out to her when vacation was over and we went back to the city. And I was like, you know, I think we should talk about menopause. We should fix menopause. Like, at least there needs to be information. There's so little information about it. And that was really at the beginning. And she was like, yeah, that's a good idea. But, you know, I have a really stable job and I don't know (laughs) how to do that. I don't know if I want to fix menopause. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And like somebody said to her also, you know, Anne, you should be really careful because if you start a menopause business, then somebody might think you're in menopause. She was like, that's kind of the point. So we wouldn't want that. Yeah. I mean, things have changed a lot in the last five years since we've been talking about this and the last four years since we've been working on it and the last two years since we've actually been launched and live to the public, like the whole world we can see it changing and we can feel it changing. At first it was really like, don't let anybody know that you might be in menopause. And now we're just like vagina and clitoris all day long to anybody. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) we were talking about vaginal dryness to like Christy Turlington. I mean, we'll talk about it to anybody. And by the way, everybody has it, you know, like 80% of women will have some sort of vaginal issue as a result of the loss of hormones in their life. And so if you don't actually start leaking or having painful sex, or if you don't become incontinent, like I did from too little estrogen, then you're lucky. But most of us are not, won't be that lucky. And and they're really simple and easy treatments, safe, effective, cheap, (laughs) available that are out there. And, And so when Anne and I started kind of thinking about this problem and very long story, but we ended up getting investors very early on before we even had a business plan or a really formed idea. We were sort of given some capital to like figure it out. And we went so hard into trying to find, even though my whole life changed after six months after my surgery, I I still wasn't taking hormone replacement therapy because even my own OB was like, oh, no, you're BRCA positive. You shouldn't take that. And the surgeon at Sloan Kettering said, just wait until you feel like you need it. But I didn't have hot flashes, so I didn't know what that meant, even though I didn't sleep for six months and gained tons of weight and was about to get divorced. Like, I didn't <laughs> I didn't know if I needed <laughs> estrogen or not yeah. until I finally started taking it. And then, you know, the first 
night of estrogen and progesterone. I slept through the night. I felt much better. I started to feel back to myself. So I've been um, happily taking it. But when we started talking about sort of how are we going to set up a business around menopause to fix menopause, we didn't think that we could get into healthcare or prescriptions. And so we were looking at like, what are the supplements that have been studied that actually work? We knew that we wanted for everything to be science-backed and evidence-based and not to sell women just another bill of goods or set of snake oil that, that we're so used to being sold. And ultimately we realized after months and months of research that really the thing that women are missing and why they're being deserved is because of the lack of access and the lack of knowledge around hormones and hormone replacement therapy. And so we're like, you know, we can't solve this problem if we don't actually hit it head on. And from there, you know, once we have solved this issue, then we can start introducing more things that, that are fun or spark joy. So we like to say to people, like, first we're solving the pain and then we're going to spark the joy. For example, we've launched an estrogen-based face cream, which um, came out of my own experience of being incontinent, as I said <laughs> earlier. So I accidentally, for three months, took half my normal dose of estrogen and started peeing in my pants and realized like, oh, those are the vaginal symptoms that I never really had before because I've been on such a steady dose of estrogen that when I didn't have enough, I accidentally induced these symptoms in myself. And yeah. it was awful, but a very simple solution. And, and so funny, because even somebody like me, who's talking about hormones, who's talking about menopause and vaginal dryness all day long, I still didn't even really recognize it in myself. I started using vaginal estrogen cream. And it like, I've never peed in my pants again. And <laughs> the symptoms went away. And I thought, this is so amazing. I'm going to start putting the vaginal cream on my face. And that's what I did. And like three months later, all my wrinkles <laughs> were gone. And this part of my face, which I'm pointing to sort of the jowly bit, like got much less. And I thought, well, well that's amazing. Let's, Let's reformulate this. Yeah, like we know that the rapid aging that happens to women's skin, men's skin too. I, my husband's now using estrogen cream too. But the rapid aging is a pure result of the loss of estrogen in your skin. What made you take the leap from putting it on your vagina to putting it on your face? What did you see besides that you weren't peeing your pants? What did you see that made you go, okay, the natural conclusion is I should be putting this on my face? Yeah, it's funny. I always forget that people don't have sort of the information when I say that about what estrogen does. Yeah. So estrogen is responsible for hydrating your cells. It's responsible for producing collagen it helps your body naturally produce hyaluronic acid. It plumps and firms your skin. Got That's it. why we use it on your vagina, because when you don't have estrogen, your skin gets thinner. It's more prone to tearing, ripping, burning. And that's certainly on your vaginal skin, sure. but also the principle is the same with any skin. We have estrogen receptors in our skin, in our hair, in our brains, in our bones, everywhere. And when you lose the estrogen, when you're going through menopause, your body reacts. It visibly reacts in your skin because it starts to get drier and thinner and more wrinkly. And all of that can be sort of one prevented to a big extent, but also improved by putting estrogen on your skin. We know from studies in face cream, when estrogen's applied topically, but also from all the studies in the FDA approved vaginal estrogen cream, which is what we sort of match the dose to, that there is no systemic uptake of the estrogen when you use it topically. So why not? I mean, all you're doing is yeah. treating your skin and, yeah. and it feels great. It's like you're putting back what you've missed. So it's not a foreign agent. It's not like a tretinoin or, or you know some of these other things that can really be irritating. It actually works better when you use it in combination with tretinoin. So it, it doesn't have to take away from any of the things that you're currently doing for your skin. It just makes it overall better. Thank you for connecting those dots for us. Being an entrepreneur, like these are the things that I spend yeah. time dreaming about. And I've sort of been the guinea pig for all of the things that we 
that we sell at Alloy because I've really tried everything. It makes your sort of evangelizing about the product, it gives it so much more value and it validates like, okay, this person who has been down this path and is experiencing these things similar to, you know, me and 50 million women in the world who are going through this are looking for that evidence and looking for the story, the story of one of the co-founders who's gone through this herself. I want to back up really quickly because I think there's something important here. I still have the conversation with women about the to HRT or to not HRT. And we talked about Mm -hmm. this study, this 2002 study, is that the year? Mm -hmm. And one of the things I had the good fortune of hearing actually from your chief medical officer at an event here in LA. And the conversation was really her setting the record straight on what happened in that 2002 report and what we know today. And a little bit of the stubbornness in the medical community, and if I can say stubbornness, to kind of rectify that study and to come back with data that we now have in the last 21 years now. That was my sort of very brief overview. Help us understand why we haven't had a new report come out to change that, (laughs) to change that narrative. That's literally the billion dollar question because that study cost a billion dollars reportedly. And so the government has to be willing to do it and spend that money. There are no pharmaceutical companies that would be willing to put the money into that because estrogen hormones are not patentable. The only patented hormone product that's on the market right now is Premarin, which is made from pregnant mare's urine. That's how mm-hmm, why it's mm-hmm. called that. It's made by Pfizer and they need to literally maintain a horse farm filled with pregnant horses. So It's off patent, but nobody else wants to do that. And a lot of women also don't really want to take Premarin, even though from a safety standpoint, and and that was the estrogen that was used. It's called a conjugated equine estrogen. Mm -hmm. That was what was used in the Women's Health Initiative study. It's safe and effective, but there are lots of, you know, issues both from the horse farm and, and just sort of people's perception because it's still branded. We don't offer it. We offer generic bioidentical estradiol and micronized progesterone, which is sort of the modern form of menopausal hormone treatment. It is not associated with any increase in breast cancer. It is associated with a decrease in Alzheimer's, in cardiovascular disease, in osteoporosis. Estrogen is actually FDA approved to prevent osteoporosis. And and the reason, you know, unfortunately why the science, we're really fighting for more science to be done, but we've lost 20 years. We've lost 20 years of data. We've lost 20 years of knowledge. We have lost 20 years of sort of interest in this topic. And pharmaceutical companies and lots of other companies are really looking for ways to innovate, which sometimes is good. But unfortunately, you know, in particular with estrogen, like we have the perfect solution, Mm. but it's not going to make a farm, you know, billions of dollars as a new drug for a pharmaceutical company or for a medical device company. Like I've been seeing, but I just saw a post about a, a company that's like extending the life of your ovaries, you know, until you're 65 or 70 in order to garner the health benefits of the ex extension of having estrogen in your body. But I mean, I conceptually, I can't figure this out. So, okay, you're going to be 70 years old and fertile. So now you need to take birth control. (laughs) Yeah. No. (laughs) Like, why do you want that? I actually love being menopausal. I love not having to buy tampons. I love not having to think about, you know, getting my period. That part hasn't bothered me one bit, but you know, it's, it's a weird time. Like certainly at 40 and not having estrogen, it's, it's a strange kind of hope don't mind my language, but it's kind of a mind fuck. Yeah. Like, am I a woman anymore? What does this mean? You know, it, it can be very challenging. And certainly if you don't have support, information and help, it's really traumatizing for a lot of women. I mean, I was speaking with someone yesterday who was angry because 
a doctor hadn't reached out to her and it had been a little more than 24 hours. And we obviously do our best, but we don't control everything in, in the process. And she was like, I'm so sorry. I'm just so tired. I haven't slept in years. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, I get it. You know, I'm really sorry that you're like, one, that we let you down, but two, that you're experiencing that. We can help you. We can fix that. Yeah. And, you know, women shouldn't have to spend five, ten years, you know, feeling miserable, not sleeping, and unfortunately contributing to chronic disease if they don't actually treat their symptoms sure. early. I'm sorry that this woman had to go 24 hours, but relative to what it takes me to get an appointment with my <laughs> OB, that's nothing. So the fact that Alloy exists and that we have access to that information and what you guys are offering, not only in education, but an actual product. Again, not to diminish her pain. I get it. It's been years since I've slept too, but wow, what a solution and how far we've yeah. come in giving women more immediate access, right? Yeah. Again, it's not perfect. And until we can like press a button and it appears in our hand, there's <laughs> always going to be a little bit of a gap. It's hard to have you here and not help us better understand. Our listeners are, you know, we all know what menopause is, but I think we're just now getting an education on the distinction between perimenopause and menopause and when we have these symptoms and what these symptoms are. Can you just, as the expert in the room, can you break down what is the difference between perimenopause and menopause? Yeah, absolutely. So perimenopause is the, let's say, seven to 10 years prior to your last period. Technically, the definition of menopause and the only way for us to really diagnose it or assess it is if you haven't menstruated in 12 months, then you are considered officially in menopause. You, you most likely will not menstruate again. But in those seven to 10 years leading up to that point, your ovaries are sort of starting to shut down their production, which their main function is to produce estrogen. So as they start to slow down, you know, realize that they're not being used for fertility and, and baby making anymore, then, you know, your body starts to react right. to that shift. I hate to use this analogy, but it's is kind of the most apt. Like if you picture an older machine, as it starts to get older, yeah. things start to break down. So, you know, you will see the effects of um, you need to add more oil, you need to tune things up, et cetera. So it's sort of the same thing with your body. Um, and the estrogen where we have receptors all over our body, there are, you know, hundreds of estrogen receptors in practically every cell that we have. When you start to either have too much or too little, your body will react. Those are the symptoms in perimenopause. Monica, to be clear, when we're in perimenopause is when we're experiencing most of our symptoms. And by the time we hit menopause, we're not, or do I have that wrong? Mm. I think for every woman, it's a little bit different. The symptoms sort of morph and change over time. So for example, the vaginal symptoms, generally, if you're untreated, you're, the vaginal symptoms will come about later in life. By the time you're in your 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, it can get pretty bad. I know an 87-year-old woman who's catheterized and has to use three pads with so much bladder leakage every day gets constant UTIs. And this is, this is actually a big killer of women, UTIs. Like you can die from a UTI, but it's totally preventable and treatable with estrogen. The symptoms like in perimenopause, a lot of women start to feel more anxious. Uh, the night sweats start, the hot flashes can start. And it's not that it ends at menopause. It can Okay. But it doesn't necessarily, and it just kind of changes, or you get used to it. <laughs> but the only way to really prevent and, and treat those symptoms is with estrogen. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, like there are other, like when you were 30 and you had tons of estrogen, weight or, you know, strength training and nutrition and all those things that were important then are still important now. It's not just that having estrogen in your body is going to make you look like you're 30 or make you have a different body than you had when you were 30 or 40 or, you know, 45, but it will set you up to be able to make better choices, to feel less anxious, to have better muscle recovery, to have better skin health, you know, brain health, not so much brain yeah. fog. A lot of women yeah. get into perimenopause and they're like, why did I come into this room? 
five times in a row. You know, what am I doing? So women, like there's a massive exodus from the workforce. I mean, there's all kinds of collateral damage that happens when women are going through this phase of life without really understanding or properly treating what's happening for them. And so, you know, we know that like women of this age group are the most prescribed antidepressants and SSRIs of any people on the planet. Right. Like, why? It leads to my next question, which is, yeah, why? Why aren't we spending more energy? We've talked about this study in 2002, but even now we can really look at socially ageism and sexism playing a real role in this and not making this season of midlife for women a priority. It's a priority for men. I mean, whether we're talking about erectile dysfunction or we're talking about hair loss or we're talking about all these other things that they come into, the solutions for them are many. They're plentiful. So why haven't we spent this time? <laughs> because nobody really wants to talk about yeah. older women except for us. I, you know, I mean, it just hasn't been in vogue and yeah. I mean, us meaning you and me, not just alloy, but all of us right now who are, you know, I, I guess is in particular Gen X where like, we're not afraid to say vagina. We're used to having to kind of fix things for ourselves. <laughs> the latchkey thing. Yeah. Is paying off. <laughs> yes. I was starting in fourth grade, a latchkey kid myself. I think that like we introduced Viagra, topical sildenafil, which is generic mm -hmm. Viagra for women. It's a cream. There are zero contraindications. The only reason to use it, like for a man, is for sexual sort of enhancement, pleasure. We know now that the clitoris and the penis are essentially the same organ biologically. The clitoris is obviously a much smaller and hidden primarily, so there's less space. Therefore, a small topical amount of cream of sildenafil actually really works to bring blood flow to the area to enhance pleasure, satisfaction, feeling. You know, a lot of women will literally lose feeling and sort of become numb in their clitoris as they age. And the only reason to use Viagra is to improve that sensation and to improve sort of libido and feeling for women. Who wants to talk about this? Yeah. It's been around for 25 years, since 1998 for men, no matter what age you are. Yeah. So, you know, whether you're young or old, and it's like a real priority. Actually, one of our doctors was talking about the experience of going to a, a doctor's appointment with her father or father-in-law who was in his 70s at the time. And the doctor, like the first thing that he said to the 75-year-old man was, we want to make sure to preserve your sexual function. Yeah. Nobody ever says that to women. Like we're told like you shouldn't enjoy it or you shouldn't act like you enjoy it unless you're actually in the moment. And then you should act like you're really enjoying yeah. it, but not too much. You know I mean? We're told so many things about how we should act sexually. Or worse yet, your function is for the man. Your sole function is for his yeah, pleasure. Exactly. Well, it's no surprise that all the solutions that we're seeing in this midlife space seem to be female founded, right? It seems like it's kind of on our shoulders, whether it's menopause or the work I'm doing, which is, you know, what are you going to do with yourself now in these years? Because you're not hireable mm -hmm. and all these other uh, questions that we're trying to tackle. But it seems like we're going to have to come up with those solutions for ourselves, unlike most things in the world that are a combination of people and yeah. no, no gender. This one is coming from us at this age. And well, because we're the ones who are experiencing it. Yeah. We're the ones who know that it's actually a thing and that it needs to be taken seriously and that we shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't feel bad about ourselves for wanting to treat our symptoms, feel better and set ourselves up for success for the next 40 years. I mean, yeah. We could live as long from today forward as we've lived this far until yeah. now. That's a really long time. And it's also time that you, you know, you're in charge of yourself, especially now in this midlife phase, like you have all the experience kind of that you need that you can use to actually, you know, produce something for the next few, yeah. few decades, as opposed to, you know, being 80 and looking back, like where, where there's, so I was reading an article about a 101 year old female park ranger. Yes, I know her. You saw her. I love that. Love woman, her. Like who became a park ranger at 85 and retired at, at 100. That's amazing. Yeah. We might not all want to do that, but we can aspire to do interesting things and stay active and engaged if we feel well. 
yeah. for the rest of your life. And this idea, like, well, it's a natural phase of life and we shouldn't have to treat it. Like, so is bad breath a natural thing, but we use yeah. toothpaste. And pretty much all of the medications that we've been taking for the last, you know, ever have been tested on men. So why, like, why would you say that women can't use topical sildenafil, for example, because it's a men's drug, like we've always been taking men's drugs and you don't have to take it orally. It's super safe. It, you know, it's very effective and kind of just a nice added tool in your toolbox to be able to enjoy yourself a little bit more either alone or with a partner. Like what's the problem? The only reason why it's not available is that nobody has wanted to talk about it or address it or even yeah. thought it was like something that's worth putting out there. So I think just having the conversation is is changing the way that we're thinking about things is bringing it to the fore in a in a way that hasn't been done up until now is yeah. is allowing us to say things like I don't want to lose my hair therefore I'm taking you know a low dose oral minoxidil right now which I'm also testing out for us to release because I don't need to develop like female pattern baldness. I don't want to, I don't want to get there. So I know that there's super safe and effective things that can prevent that. And it's my choice to be able to do it. It all kind of unfortunately goes back to equity, like equity between men and yeah. women, health equity. You had asked a question earlier about, or in our emails about why are black women yeah. experiencing menopause more severely and and are less treated than white women and it all goes back to mistrust in the medical system um just lack of validating women who come in with complaints or issues or you know treating symptoms as complaints and you know women who are reporting symptoms like anxiety or or hot flashes annoying bothersome patients that are like just taking up time like it's a way of treating and framing women who are coming in without validating and, and really, you know, accepting what they're saying as truth, we dismiss. And we, I think we've seen that women of color are dismissed sort of more readily than white women in the United States. It seems like everything that you're saying, everything that you're pointing to is this idea of collective dismissing of an age, of a gender, of issues of a race, it seems like this notion of just go quietly kind of into the darkness, like just fade away is being readdressed. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the ways that we have tried to address this with Alloy specifically is one, we're, we're direct to consumer. So we're speaking directly to women. I think one of the reasons why we've been very successful at it so far is that we're in it. We know what we're looking for. Yeah. And so we're sort of bringing these solutions that we personally are looking for and want to use to the broader public. And we're doing it at a price point that is accessible because we we don't want it to be that you can only reach a doctor who is literate in menopause if you have insurance, if you live in a specific place, if you have access to a special type of doctor, you know, that like are, are generally hard to find. There are only a thousand trained menopause practitioners that includes pharmacists, ner nurse practitioners and doctors and like anybody in the United States. And there are 55 million women in some stage yeah. of menopause. So just from a math perspective, it doesn't, it doesn't add up. We also, our, our process is asynchronous. So it's done through messaging. It's not a video conference like you and I are having right now, which allows us to scale the expertise to, you know, a way wider audience of women at a much lower cost. So it's very inexpensive. You get a response from the doctor within hours, minutes, hours to, you know, a day, as opposed to having to wait weeks or months to go see your practitioner. You can ask your questions when you have them and not have to save everything up for this 10 minute block that, you know, as you and I just had a, a technology issue, like then what <laughs> happens? Even telehealth, you know, you think it's going to be more convenient, but like something Stuff happens. Happens. happens now you've yeah. missed your slot or for doctors, it's really a pain because people don't show up a lot of the time. They don't value it in the same way. And so this we want to fit into women's lives in the way that we as women are accustomed to living them. 
I mean, I certainly hardly communicate by phone anymore, except with a couple of people, personal friends, but I'm yeah. always texting. And, you know, so it's it's not an unusual behavior for us. It's much more convenient. These things are need to haves, not lucky to have or nice to have. It's like you you, you should take care of yourself. We're, we're always the last in line, when, you know, when we're lining up for care. And I think that that needs to change. To make it so easy to democratize what you guys have been able to amass in terms of both education and then the, the product itself and then giving us access to this expertise. And I would say you're not just talking to an, you know somebody who knows kind of a trained OB. You're talking to somebody who knows these symptoms. They're hearing them on repeat over and over and over, over again. Over and over again. And who cares? They really care. Yeah. So <laughs> I think I think that's what's so, I mean, thank you. We'll just say that. Thank you for the work that you're doing. I look forward to the day when we can come on to myalloy.com and there's all sorts of solutions for yeah. all of our kind of female needs and that our daughters, uh, you know, don't have to go through this gap in knowledge and access. I I appreciate so much that work. And, and we'll say, you know, we talked about when you first started thinking about this and then the four years that Alloy has been working on this and then the two years that you've seen the conversation really shift. I mean, you guys have been leaders in that space. I said earlier that I I got to hear from your chief medical um, officer, uh, Sharon Malone, and the work that she is doing just to kind of evangelize what's happening and what's happened and the need. I mean, she's been on Drew Barrymore. She's been, you know, she's talking to Oprah and Maria Shriver, and she's talking live and on YouTube. There's so much good that's coming of this. And I think women feel more equipped to handle the conversation with an OB that isn't a specialist in in menopause. They feel like they have the questions. Exactly. That's our goal is is for women to feel equipped. And if look, if women can get great care from their own personal doctor and and you know in person and that's great. Yeah. <laughs> We're in favor of that. But most women can't. I was in the middle of New York City. I had enough education and, and money and connections. I grew up in New York. I was living around the corner from where I grew up. Like, yeah. you know, if if I couldn't find the the information and the help or Oprah Winfrey herself also went to five doctors and had heart palpitations and, you know, still w- was 50 years old or however old she was. And like nobody connected the dots until finally somebody yeah. did next day she was fine. It's amazing how it works. And it's amazing how, how women are just, you know, ritually dismissed um, in a way that just is, is actually really damaging, obviously, for women and their qualities of life. It's damaging for the, our overall society, you know, our, our sort of the cost to the healthcare system is tremendous from all this unnecessary osteoporosis or Alzheimer's or heart disease and things that we, you know, we can control. UTIs is a huge cost to the system. Families who then need to take care of, you know, older women who are having all of these problems, doctor visits. I mean, it, it's, it's tremendous the cost that, that we are enduring societally. Well, what you said earlier, even about brain fog what and and being able to stay in the workplace longer i mean there's there's so much that that you guys are tackling in this and thank you thank you for the work that you're doing it's really fun i love it it's obvious it's obvious <laughs> that you're passionate about it and you put that dreamer in you to to really good use um and i'm glad that what started with uh food confection has led to you being kind of realized in this way yeah and I have to ask you, you know, our podcast is called Liberty Road, so I have to end the podcast with this, but how has launching Alloy, how has this work in the um, peri and menopausal space, how has it liberated you, the woman? Oh, it's been tremendous. I mean, one, just the feeling of of competence and confidence that I have now as a result of sort of starting two pretty successful businesses and you know, as I said earlier, getting people to line up behind me, around me, you know, sort of yeah. join this vision and and the quality of people who have been a part of this journey from Sharon Malone to Anne, my partner, to, 
you know, all of the doctors who are on our platform. And we were very selective about making sure that we actually have really trained, like most of our doctors, our sweet spot is OBs who have retired from, you know, their in-person practice and have now been through this life phase themselves. And, you know, we're all kind of in marching to the same drummer and, and it's been an unbelievably satisfying, um, really meaningful, gratifying experience, both personally, but also, you know, the feedback that we get from women, like thanking us for saving their lives and for validating how they're feeling and for getting them back to sleep, all the things. So it's really wonderful. And and even like we have a bunch of a few younger women on our team. We also have a lot of women in, in our own age group and we have a few dudes. But with the younger women in particular, I think this idea that like being prepared and really understanding our bodies and being prepared for what's coming next is is smart. Yeah. There shouldn't be fear in it. The more you know, the better decisions you can make, the better you can prepare for the future, the, just the more relaxed you can feel overall because it shouldn't be shrouded in shame or in secrecy. This is every single woman, should she live long enough or anybody with ovaries, trans men as well, will go through menopause because it is a natural phase, but it doesn't mean that we have to suffer as a result, that we need to stop caring for ourselves, that we wouldn't treat our, you know, if you were deficient in in thyroid hormone, you would take thyroid hormone. Yeah. It's kind of the same concept. So it's it's just been a hugely liberating and gratifying thing. Also, you know, as I told you, I didn't really work hard full time for 10 years yeah. outside of the home. I mean, I, you know, of those 10 years, like five, I was working, but it was always taking the back seat to to my home life. And um, now, in particular with Alloy, it's really, I mean, but although with Cetamil, too, my sons, I have two sons, and they both are so engaged and, I think, you know, impressed and really enjoy this entrepreneurial process and kind of living it with me and through me, and um, they're really a part of it. They're, you know, so that has been really gratifying as well. I think also the, you know, with my, my husband is is also, you know, has been really supportive and is kind of impressed, like, oh, wow, she can, do, <laughs> she can do all this, you know, which is nice. I never had that sense. I kind of thought I could, was capable, but I, you know, I think like all of us, we, especially as we're younger, we go through so many just different feelings of like, can I do this? Can I not do this? Where are my boundaries? And And I think that that is something also that's really gratifying about getting to this age is like, we have so much experience at this point. You know, we have so many people in our lives. I have such a giant network that I have been able to activate around this problem. And it's been so magical and wonderful that um, I don't know if I would do it again. <laughs> it's a lot of work. I live in the Netherlands, but I work on Eastern time. So I, I'm just constantly working because I'm, you know, I start my technical work day at 3 p.m. and then I'm on Zoom all oh night gosh. until 11 or so. And then I, I start my regular day, my daytime day the next morning at 7.30. So it's, it's a lot. It's very busy. Wow, that's intense. It's intense, but it's a testament to uh, how passionate you are about the work that you're doing. And yeah, I love hearing how it has liberated you, how it is liberating so many women who are using alloy to lead better lives. And you've liberated our listener in thinking about the parallels between your life and taking time off and going back part-time and finding a place where they really felt like they could thrive. Uh, you've inspired so many people to consider what that could mean for themselves. So thank you so much, Monica, for spending this time with us. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. No, I really appreciate it. I love I love your podcast. That's how I, I got here in the first place because I've been listening to you and I, I really enjoy what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you so much. And Liberty listeners, we will have every way you can get connected to Alloy in the show notes, myalloy.com, their handle on Instagram, and even YouTube. There's a few really interesting things you guys are doing on YouTube. So I'd love to connect our listeners with that. And thanks for hanging out with Monica and thanks for hanging out with me. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Bye for now. Liberty Road is broadcast on all platforms, Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcast, and more. 
If you like what you've heard, please follow, rate, and review Liberty Road on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It helps us to know if these episodes are inspiring and equipping you to move into your middle third with intention. Liberty Road is created by executive producer Netta Jones, supervising producer Elizabeth Windham, producer Julia Windham, and music by Jack Jones. The holidays are coming. Find a gift for someone special with jewelry from Blue Nile. Right now, Blue Nile is offering special Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals. Save up to 50% on the season's most stunning trends. Blue Nile offers an endless selection of bold gold styles, gemstone jewelry, and classic diamond pieces. And now, for a limited time, get 36 months special financing on minimum purchases of $1,000. Restrictions apply. See BlueNile.com for details. That's BlueNile.com.